John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. It's good to see you guys. Um, we've got an interesting show today um, because we're not really going to be dissecting an accident from the past. We're going to talk about a current event that took place just recently on a baby reveal and then we're going to jump to talking about engines and the, the possibility that there are a number of engines flying somewhere in the world with some bogus parts, falsified records, and a variety of other things. So, so Todd, let's get started with the baby reveal. And and again, you know, when we look at it, uh, one of those things, uh, this baby reveal um, uh you know, exercise that takes place on a pretty regular basis anymore um, has become a real phenomenon and people are getting very creative as to how they want to introduce the gender of their uh, to be born son or daughter. And there was a recent video floating around on the internet involving a agricultural type airplane that uh, was being used to uh, reveal the gender of a young couple's uh, soon to be born baby. And uh, you you provided the video and and I, I know I shouldn't laugh because it did involve a fatality, but you just have to shake your head at some of these things. And, and it just is amazing to me um, when I see accidents like this, especially those captured on video, you can't help but think and start dissecting Okay, as an investigator, what would I be looking at? Well, this uh, video, those of you watching the video version of this will see it. And I'll keep the audio on low in the background so audio-only listeners can get a feel for this. Uh, this is a baby reveal party. All three of us are parents, but we're from an era when these sorts of things were not a public spectacle and well before YouTube. And as is the case, uh, these uh, event, this event was being recorded for later distribution on social media happened only two days before we recorded this, so we have very little information about it, but the video tells a lot. You have the two parents about to reveal the gender of their baby. In the background, you see a Piper 25 Pawnee coming more or less directly at the crowd at a fairly low altitude, I would guess well under 200 feet. And shortly before it passes the uh, reveal party, it sharply pulls up, releases some smoke, and the left wing uh, collapses and it, spins around and crashes uh, about 100 yards or so away from the, from the people. No one in the reveal party was injured. Unfortunately, the pilot was killed. Now, there's several things about this that caught my eye, not just the visuals of it. Uh, this happened in Mexico. And from my years of looking at aviation safety events around the world, one of the countries where I've had consistent problems trying to find publicly available analyses of incidents and accidents was Mexico. I'm sure they have them somewhere. They just don't have them easily available online. So whatever analysis uh, uh, people like us might provide for this might be the only thing you'll find. I seriously doubt you'll see a full official report from the Mexican government where they'll go into details as to the history of this aircraft, the competence or the, the experience of the pilot, 
or what about the planning of this uh, violated uh, civil aviation regulations in Mexico? I'll say yeah. this. It's pretty obvious it would not have passed muster in the United States. Well, when you when you look at the Piper Pawnee, it was a popular airplane here in the States um, because it is an ag airplane. And there's a lot of them still in use. Uh, they they tow banners and, and a variety of other things. But uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the ag operators, especially out here in Colorado, have gone to the uh, the turbine version of the ag truck and a few other types of aircraft. But John, this is more up uh, your alley when we when we start looking at the structure. You know, when you look at an ag airplane and the abuse, not only the the abuse that the airplane takes, but then you start looking at all the chemicals that are cycling through an airplane like that, a lot of which are corrosive. What what's the first thing that you think of when uh, a wing folds up? Um, you know, and it wasn't necessarily a high G pull. It was probably going to be just a regular pull up that, you know, the pilot would have done during any kind of ag spray. Yeah, well, it does look like exactly that. At the end of a spray, the end of the field, uh, he would pull it up and make a U-turn. Uh, some of them can be quite aggressive. It doesn't look that aggressive on the on the video that, she, that uh, Todd shared with us. But these airplanes, because of the environment they operate on, whether they're in Mexico or the United States or wherever in the world, they require a lot of attention because you're mentioned the chemicals that we use in in uh, fertilizing the nitrogens and in and, uh, and other many other things that can have an effect on aviation grade aluminum uh, you know many many of these tanks are either uh, plastic fiberglass or stainless steel not aluminum so that uh, you know that these chemicals and aluminum don't get along together so that means you need to have a lot of uh, inspections and a, a lot of rework to keep the airplanes in good shape. This was not a new airplane in any way, shape, or manner. It was uh, anywhere from 59 to, to uh, I've forgotten the upper end. I think it was 81. Clearly, clearly over 40 years old and operating in Mexico with, a, with an aviation authority that has long been known to be uh, not the best in overseeing their aviation infrastructure. I mean, 40 years ago, I can remember being in Mexico and coming in contact with a lot of this type of airplane down in Baja, and uh, they were pretty sick airplanes. So it's, you know, it's almost like they were used, their useful life was taken out of them in the United States, and then they were sent down there, and they continued to fly down there uh, with any, without any real inspections or maintenance work done to them. It was like always band-aids on their part. I mean, I've inspected a number of airplanes in Mexico, general aviation and commercial, business commercial, and they never cease to amaze me in the in the level of degradation of the of the uh, fuselage and uh, nobody cares. There's really no effort made to to correct all those deficiencies on the airplane. Yeah, and it's uh, and unfortunately, it's a sad story because the pilot was a young guy, thirty-two years old, and um, and so while you know all the intentions were good, um, it had a a very tragic ending, and I think uh, Todd, you were mentioning before we uh, we started rolling on this, you know, some of the takeaways that you know because this is a new type of activity for for parents, um, these gender reveals, it's kind of like the evolution of uh, going to the prom and asking your date to the prom, all of a sudden now, guys are getting very exotic with the way they ask a date to a prom. Well, these gender reveals, these people are getting real exotic rather than just showing up and popping a few little poppers with blue or pink. I mean, they're getting pretty elaborate with, uh, with the way they reveal the gender of their soon-to-be child. And without going to agree, so, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. Well, I'm not going to go into a, a chapter and verse on the regulations on doing this, but if you happen to be in a in a position to use an aircraft to do this sort of thing, just keep in mind that there are very, very strict uh, regulations about flying aircraft in close proximity to structures and other people. And if you're doing something where, or in this case, they're releasing smoke, that gets into a whole different level of regulation. And yes, if you can 
do it the right way, it might take you weeks. More likely, uh, anyone who's going to use an aviation asset for a gender reveal party will use an, a commercial off-the-shelf drone. Same thing applies. Common sense applies. You don't want to fly something directly over people where it might uh, lose control and hurt someone. You definitely don't want to fly something like this if you're in any way, short, shape, or form impaired by any means, hmm. by uh, too much uh, birthday cake or whatever. And again, this is a serious thing. Both the baby reveal, having a child, and flying an aircraft. Doing these three serious things at once, put some thought into it. You know, given yeah. the location where this occurred, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me that the pilot of this airplane was at very least a good friend of the, the people revealing the parents. And, you know, that adds to a lot of pain to, to an otherwise event that's supposed to be a celebration. So it's, yeah. uh, it really is a tragedy. Well, let's, let's switch gears and I'm just going to segue through another event that we have to at least mention. Um, and that is uh, the loss of a, a very well-known person, Jimmy Buffett, who was an avid general aviation pilot, owned a number of aircraft. And um, it's sad that uh, somebody with his talent that I know the three of us grew up listening to his music and, and were paired heads and you know really appreciated what he did in the music world but also appreciated the attention he brought to general aviation and flying in general, because he was such an avid flyer. He did fly with a lot of people, had some very cool airplanes and, uh, and it's just sad. And in fact, he actually survived two aircraft accidents. So, um, you know, he, uh, he had the, the, the lucky charm on his side when, uh, when those accidents happened, but, uh, Unfortunately, he did pass away, but we have uh, at least some really good music to remember him by and definitely equate it to, uh, you know, the seaplanes that uh, made him famous and made uh, Margaritaville famous as well. Now, well, uh, I, just I, th listened, I just listened to one of his songs today where he talks at, at length at one of his concerts about the airplanes and about flying and about how expensive fuel is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, he was he was never one to to be shy with some of the issues that we talk about and that have been talked about in aviation and um he had a good platform to at least question it and um you know what impact that may or may not have had who knows but the good thing is is that he did represent a voice for the rest of us. Well, I I happened to be in in Key West uh the last few days. And I can tell you that the tribute from his fans was was uh, large, very large. And I know the teetotaler that you are, you would not have indulged in any kind of margaritas to uh, celebrate Margaritaville. I did not have not one margarita. I know you didn't have <laughs> one. Did not have one. I, <laughs> I, I, I one. totally believe you. It was a bottomless margarita. It was a it was a bottomless margarita, and yeah. started before twelve o'clock, so it was five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't five o'clock in Key West. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so there yeah. was a lot of people, a lot of tributes. I mean, a lot of people walking around with a shake, a shake of salt in the hand, <laughs> and you walk into the into the refreshment centers, and the bottle. Of, the salt shaker went right on the bar in front of you. It was lots of those around. I'll bet. Well, transitioning once again then to a, a very serious subject. And the three of us, um, we can uh, reflect back to the late 80s, early 90s, when there was a, a big issue um, with regard to bogus parts floating into the world of aviation. Um, a lot of them were coming out of South America, and these bogus parts were finding their way onto uh, especially commercial aircraft, but in, in general aviation as well. And I remember that was an issue that we even looked at during the course of uh, the value jet investigation was a concern for possibly some bogus parts, as well as some other uh, investigations. And I remember, John, when even Mary Schiavo, who uh, was the, at the DOTIG's office, 
I remember her coming into the MTSB and briefing us on uh, suspected unapproved parts or bogus parts that were making their way onto aircraft. And now it looks like we are seeing it again through EASA, through the European agency, uh, similar to the FAA, who's identified an issue with regard to a specific company who apparently is falsifying records and uh, stating that the, the parts that they are either shipping out or actually putting on an engine um, have been uh, certified when in fact they haven't. And it's not one or two parts, it's quite a few parts. You know, that, that whole issue of parts uh, is a, a gray and, and sometimes a very dark gray area. You know, we had a lot of material when airplanes went bankrupt, uh, airlines, excuse me, went bankrupt. And a lot of their inventory uh, made it out because of, you know, being sold, being stolen, whatever the reason, but it was filtered out into the business without the paperwork to support it. You know, and I served on the, on the suspected unapproved parts uh, working group for the FAA in the, in the early 90s, 93, 94, uh, before I went to the MTSB. And uh, we chased down a whole bunch of, of uh, unapproved parts as well as bogus parts. And bogus parts, differences, they're just parts made with inferior materials and, and made to look like the original and sold for the price. And one of the, one of the ones I use often in my presentations is there's a bolt that holds on the vertical stabilizer of the MD-80, DC-9 MD-80. And back in the, in the, in the 80s, that bolt cost $4,000. Hmm. And somebody was somewhere was making them out of just steel, you know, not high quality uh, and high alloy aviation product and plating them so they look just like the original and selling them for the $4,000 and maybe even discounting them a little so they could move the product, but they weren't as strong as the original. And only after a little uh, use, the wear on them just showed up. But uh, through the inspections, but what if you didn't do the inspections? What if the airplane was operated someplace like Mexico or, or some further south in South America or Africa where they don't have the, the strong uh, oversight from their governments to mandate those inspections and these these parts will wear out much quicker and, and uh, cause big problems. So you got, you got two, two issues in that in the parts business. One is good parts with no paperwork and bad parts that usually do have paperwork, all fraudulent, but they have paperwork to go with them. So you well, really have to be diligent. The big concern now is that these are engine parts and they're on the CFM 56 engine, which is a very popular engine because it sits on, the, on the, the Airbus 320 series aircraft and on the, uh, the Boeing 737NG. And the, even the military uses it, the Navy uses it on, on their 737, which is called the, the Poseidon. And, and Todd, you know, we've, we've seen when we've had catastrophic engine failures, we saw one not too long ago on a Boeing 777 coming out of Denver, heading to Honolulu. Um, they were they were really fortunate that when that engine let go, um, they were able to return. And while this isn't that that particular event wasn't related to bogus parts and and what we're talking about now, just the extreme nature of that kind of engine failure and the fact that that engine they couldn't put the fire out on the engine. Now you have an engine that may be um, you know being used on an airplane that is. Uh, going over water for an extended period of time, we have a catastrophic failure. And, you know, you're two hours from uh, the nearest any place <laughs> to put that airplane down. Um, and and we've seen this in the past where if parts um, breach the containment ring on those engines and penetrate the fuselage causing pressurization problems or even serious injury or or fatalities to people sitting in close proximity. This whole situation um, could really get to be um, a, a cataclysmic event over the next several years 
if they don't get these parts out of circulation. It's a big issue. It is a big issue. And I thought it was behind us. I mean, after the in the, after like 95 and 96, with so much emphasis on it by the FAA and EASA in Europe, CAA uh, led the charge over in, on that side, the, the British. Uh, I thought the issue was finally dead. But those parts were probably sitting in a warehouse someplace just waiting to come back, waiting for everybody to get lax because it, you know, it hadn't reared its ugly head in a while. And then here they come again. This is uh, yeah. reminds me of one of those generational sort of issues where it happens generation after generation, which means there is a need to educate continuously those who are coming uh, into the field, especially we've worked with with maintenance uh, communities and, and maintenance schools. This is the kind of thing where someone new to the business is thinking, why is there so much emphasis on just documenting every darn little thing? Why am I spending time doing this and not out there where the airplanes are? Well, as you said about suspected unapproved parts, one of the things that makes it suspected unapproved is bad paperwork or incomplete paperwork or incorrectly done paperwork. So this is just a reminder, an emphasis reminder. Uh, the documentation's there for a reason. The procedures are there for a reason. And that's part of the profession. Yeah, and, and again, as we cycle in new people, because we do have a shortage on the maintenance side of the house, just like we're seeing with, uh, with the shortage of pilots and, of course, air traffic controllers, it is not only about the education, but it's about guys like John who have that historical knowledge, who can put that emphasis, that exclamation point, if you will, on the need to do things right, even when nobody's looking because of the serious nature of this kind of event that could possibly take place. Now with engines, of course, it I mean, you have those engines rotating, parts of those engines are rotating in, you know, several thousand RPM. Other parts of the engine are, you know, 40, 50,000 RPM. And if you lose a blade or something starts to come apart, bad things are going to happen. And um, and so, John, when when you look at this, uh, I presume that they'll they'll put special procedures in, in inspection uh, procedures in place. Do you think that this could cause or lead to a grounding of airplanes that may be in a suspected serial number range where people might think some of these parts reside? Or is it just too broad spectrum to, to even think that way and you know you're just going to have to have every airline operating these airplanes with these engines um go out there and inspect them like right now well I, what uh, what i read initially about what has happened so far is uh, the the uh, the company that they've identified as selling these parts they've gone in and and commandeered their records to see who they've sold bits and pieces to and separately, they've gone out to the industry and told them, if you have any parts that have passed through the hands of this company, identify them if they're on an airplane, uh, identify where they are, and an evaluation has to be made whether or not we need to, to go back in and change these parts again. In some cases, it might mean the engine's got to come off the wing and go into a shop to be disassembled. So it's not an insignificant event. So it's, it's, uh, it is. It is troubling, and you know I know in the in the U.S. and some of the larger airlines, some of them, all of them, uh, receiving inspection is done by a mechanic that that knows what he's doing normally and pays attention to detail. I I know of a couple of cases here in the U.S. where a a part was received at receiving inspection, and one shop by mechanic looked at the box that the part came in. And the logo for the manufacturer, it happened to be Pratt and Whitney, and they put their eagle on it. Well, the eagle didn't look like the eagle, and it wasn't in the right place. So he immediately pulled that part out. Another time, uh, a mechanic on the receiving inspection received an engine part, and when he put it in his hand, it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. So he said it to his supervisor, and the supervisor, who, you know, the trouble with many supervisors is, they, they're so far removed from the floor, usually, they, you know, were mechanics 20 years ago. Now they're the manager in an area, and they've, they've lost some of the, the, the edge that they may have had. 
And the supervisor looked at it and said, it'll be fine, just let's send it on. Well, this guy didn't send it on. And when there was a break in, in uh, work that he had to do, he went up to the engineering department and the first, the manager in the engineering department looked at it and said, no, nah, I think it's okay. But when he was going out, he, he ran into a young engineer, somebody, you know, 25, 26 year old guy said, let me see what you have there. And they got looking at it and they dug into it a little deeper and it was in fact a bogus file. Hmm. So it's, it's sometimes just a feel, just, you know, intuition uh, can make the difference on the part of the mechanic. And the responsibility for all of that rests with the installer, which I always thought was wrong. Maybe they needed to be a shared responsibility. But under the FARs, the, the guy who puts the the, uh, the pot on the airplane is responsible for that. So here you have somebody that's working out in, a, in an engine shop or, or out in the field, and he identifies a problem with, with an engine, Orders up a pot through the system within their organization. I mean, he's not going out and buying this himself at, at the Harry's Pot Store. The company has a process in place, and they ship him the pot from, from stores, and he installs it. But now if it's wrong, he's the one responsible for it. And yeah. that's wrong because if the system failed, not just him. Well, but, but we've got a system, unfortunately, in aviation where we we have tacit trust um, throughout yeah. the aviation industry. I mean, I order a part for my airplane. I just assume that if I order it from one of the third party vendors who got it from, you know, direct from the manufacturer of the aircraft or, you know, a, a an approved parts uh, production company, I, I, it's tacit trust that I just assume that it meets all the necessary spec that when I install it on my airplane, it's going to operate as though it was, you know, uh, an original manufactured part. And again, like you were talking about, it takes a trained eye. Well, you know, we have general aviation mechanics out there, and we've talked about it on this show with shade tree mechanics, buying stuff off the internet, um, trying to shave the price of what it would cost them and still make a buck um off of the the customer i i did a helicopter accident five fatal killed the whole family in uh, south dakota and um it was a loach which basically is a hughes 500 helicopter the operator of that particular tour company was doing just that they were they were scouring um you know cockroach corner if you will looking for cheap parts and they did find some cheap parts one of them was called a TT strap, which is basically a layered stainless steel strap that uh, mates to one of the rotor blades on the rotor head. And they're very expensive. They have to be changed out. And because they're layered, I think this one had 30 to 40 stainless steel straps that encompass in the, in the main TT strap, uh, corrosion and corrosion pitting occurred. Well, they bought some of these TT straps out of San Diego that were supposedly yellow tack. Those parts are not reusable. They're throwaway parts. Well, somebody found a batch of them and yellow tagged them. Somebody wasn't educated enough to know that. They got it. They put it on the helicopter and about 30 hours into service, one of those, one of those uh, rotor blades let go, killed the whole family. And, and so it's out there and it probably on a smaller scale continues, John, but you know, I mean, right now, Todd, you go out there, you pre-flight the airplane, you just assume that everything on that airplane, just like I do, um, when we go out and fly, we just assume that everything on that airplane is good to go. And I assume that uh, if I even feel there's something off kilter, that I'm not going to fly it. Or if I think for a minute that there's something that is odd, unusual, or I just don't like the look of the person who was like the, the mechanic that day, anything, I'm the kind of guy where I don't know enough to know what I don't know. So if I'm even the least bit suspicious, I'm not flying. Yeah. I remember your story about the wing. Oh, yeah. The, of the new wing. Why is this wing looking brand new? And I, yeah. I well, once I dug into the story, I'm not going to go into the detail, but it had a previous accident, had been repaired. It was all on the up and up. And I felt confident flying that airplane. 
But uh, after I saw that new wing, I had questions. I wasn't mm-hmm. going to be satisfied until I got some answers, including a Freedom of Information Act request that gave me very, very detailed explanation of what the story was. Well, we'll be following this uh, this engine story because I'm I'm really concerned that we're going to start to see some events out there that could involve some of these uh, these suspected unapproved parts, and um, and it's probably going to take a while to to track these parts down, get them off the aircraft that are out there flying right now around the world. So uh, we'll we'll definitely continue to follow this. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a fun new podcast called So There I Was. If you're a fan of aviation or simply enjoy hearing captivating stories, then this is the podcast for you. Hosted by former Marine pilots Fig and Repeat, this podcast shares first-hand accounts of flying experiences that will have you on the edge of your seat. Whether you're in the mood for something funny, scary, poignant, or tragic, this podcast has it all. With a relaxed and conversational tone, the pilots share their stories like you're sitting right there with them at the bar after a flight. Hear from fighter pilots, astronauts, Blue Angels, aircraft carrier captains, Navy and Coast Guard rescue pilots, and many more. Most have survived near-death experiences. Others have overcome incredible disabilities to continue to fly airplanes. You'll hear about heart-pumping moments in the cockpit, hilarious screw-ups during flights, insane hijinks off-duty, and the challenges pilots routinely face. Hear what it feels like to be shot off the bow of a carrier or into space. Experience the terror of landing on a pitching deck on a night so black that the pilot can barely taxi afterwards because his legs are shaking so badly. Hear firsthand how lonely it is to be in the middle of the ocean in a life raft on a dark night in eight-foot seas. Each story is unique and told with a level of detail that will make you feel like you were there. You'll laugh. You'll cry. You'll laugh until you cry. But one thing is certain. You won't be bored. So there I was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. Go ahead, John. Just one last thought. One of the big problems in, that the governments, the FAA and others, are going to have uh, in this period of time is we have a number of, of 737s and uh, Airbus 319 20, 21 series airplanes, as well as uh, I just read there was two already two seven eight sevens broken up for parts, uh, and those parts don't go away. The airplanes are old; they either had a problem somewhere, ground collision, a stress on the airframe, something, and they're, they're coming up, uh, going into the parts business. You know, they go to these facilities, they get dismantled. They don't get destroyed; they get dismantled, and parts are removed from them, doors, windows. Uh, landing gear, the list goes on and on. And those are reused in airplanes later because they're such expensive parts and the people who break up these airplanes uh, can sell them for considerably less. So now the, the all these authorities are going to really have a handful, their hands full, with trying to keep track of all this stuff because, I mean, there's, there's five or six or 7,000 uh, 737 still flying. It's probably three or 4,000 Airbus 319 2021 series flying. So those airplanes are all wanting parts, and uh, the airlines and the operators all want to find the parts at the cheapest possible price they can because it is so expensive to keep those airplanes in the air. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on the authorities to focus the attention of everybody in this business to those uh, where those parts are coming from and what condition they're in. Well, I was reading somewhere where they said that there's over 33,000 of these engines out there in circulation. Um, not that every one of them has these parts on it, but it's still a high number for a, a potential. Um, and and so again, it's going to be something that we're going to we're going to track and and see if anything serious comes out of uh, out of these events that. Uh, that could possibly happen. Well, gentlemen, um, it's always good to see you and uh, and talk about uh, current events um, because that's as important as dissecting accidents for the lessons learned. And I think uh, there were a couple of things that we were able to learn today. So with that, Todd, I will leave you with our second to the last word. Well, it's a quick word this time, and it takes us back to Mexico. Just a reminder, 
if you want to use aviation, I don't care if it's a drone or a jet, to have a more spectacular video, to get more likes and clicks, think twice. Yes. And John, I'm going to leave you, as I always do, in your hopefully sober state with our last word. Yes, and I just, and the preacher in me is right here saying that, you know, if you're going to go flying, do a good pre-planning session, do it at home before you go to the airport, do it again at the airport. Remember, the weather here, there, and everything in between, don't do something stupid like flying into box canyons to show it off with your, your girlfriend or wife or whoever. We've had, you know, a recent event like that. And when you get out to your airplane, do a very thorough free flight. You know, don't you know, don't overlook the flight controls at all. Touch your airplane. And after you get in the air, put that head on a swivel because we have a lot of new people out there. We have a lot of near misses. Uh, with students and with with instructors on board so it's a crowded place that people make mistakes and please please fly safely thank you for checking out our show we really value our listeners and subscribers our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it so please give us five stars in your podcast platform we want to keep in contact with you we are on facebook twitter Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.